Bible, turn to Philippians, Philippians chapter 2. We're just kind of working through uh, some of Paul's letter here on joy. And ironic, he's writing about joy while he's in prison, so that's pretty fascinating right off the bat. But today we're going to talk about success. What is success? How is it modeled here for us in Philippians? Taking a little different angle. Not so much what Paul is saying, but watching a little bit of what he's doing. Getting a little background on some of the value that he places on people. Success today certainly can be defined by money and finance, if that's what we're talking about. If we're talking about success in finance, then you can see if they are doing really well in finance, then they're successful. But life success can often be determined by the same factor, and that's not true. We know that's not true. Success in life is not contingent upon money or advancement in business or enlarging a business. So found some great lines here for some successful, financially successful people. Mark Cuban, big Pittsburgh Steelers fan, right? We all know that from Pittsburgh. Uh, Key being from, he has this little house in Texas, I think now, this little 24,000 square foot home there. Uh, listen to what he said about success. He goes, I was happy and I felt I was successful when I was poor, living with six guys in a bedroom apartment sleeping on the floor. See, we're seeing the difference between financial success, of which he happens to have, but talking more broadly about what is success in living. Here's one, the youngest billionaire. He was a billionaire at age 31. That would be Bill Gates. He is now 68 and has somehow managed $124 billion. He said this, success, know that you made a difference. Inventing something, raising kids, or helping people in need. See, it's profound in that it's a financially successful person, and very often we're after that. In fact, we'll even say, go to college, get a degree so that, let them finish the sentence, so that you could make really good money, as if that's the target. So much of what we do, getting us poised to make more money. There's an assumption there, and the assumption is that means success and that means happiness. There is a broader category, a life principle, which has to do more with taking care of people's needs. As Bill Gates said, finally, 44th President of the United States, Barack Obama, said this, success isn't about how much money you have, it's about the difference you make in people's lives. So all of a sudden, we see the value just stand out of a sports coach. And I was going to say no one knows more than a sports coach about the influence. That's not true. It's the athletes. How many of you were on a sports team maybe growing up and your coach was one of, still looking back, one of the biggest influences in your life? Let me see your hand. Yeah. Yeah. That remarkable? How about teacher? There was a teacher along the way that big, yeah, okay. What's humbling is we would think, talk Christian life for a minute, we'll think that what we're doing on a Sunday morning, that my message to you, my sermon, will change your life. No, it may put you to sleep. If that's, if, and if you need sleep, you're welcome. But as you look back at what's most influenced your life, you're not going to probably point to a sermon. Most of us point to somebody. And whether they had an official role, which could be coach, teacher, how about a grandparent? Someone's grandparent greatly influenced you. Okay, if your grandparent is in the room, raise your hand. Just 
Yeah, you yeah, see, look at this. Oh, that's sweet. Hey, hand was up before I even said that. Last part. Was it? I'm not sure that. No, I don't. Yeah, okay. We're just going to go with that. We all point to somebody. We point to somebody in our life that came alongside us at the right time. Well, that actually is success in life. Success in life. I loved that we actually had named Bill Gates when he said, make a difference inventing something. And I'm like, oh, not exactly an inventor. But to follow it with raising kids or just helping somebody in need. You see the value that reveals. Well, we actually see that in the life of Paul, and I think you're going to see it maybe in some ways that you hadn't noticed before as we look at the passage here in Philippians chapter 2. But notice, we're going to be looking at verses 19 till the end, 19 to 30 of Philippians 2. But there's an anchor verse earlier on, and it's verse 5. He said, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who thought he was in the form, or though he were in the form of God, did not count equality with God something to be grasped. Have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. This humility that Jesus had that we have in relationships with other people. Take a look now all the way to verse 19. He says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests and those of Jesus Christ. You know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father who has served with me in the gospel, I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me, and I trust the Lord that shortly I myself will also come to you. Whole section on Timothy. Now, verse 25, I have thought it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier and your messenger ministry to my need, for you've been longing, <clears throat> for he has been longing for you and has been distressed because he heard, uh, because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near death, but God had mercy on him, not only on him, but also on me, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. All about the thought of possibly losing Epaphroditus. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again and that I would be less anxious. Take a look at our first point today in valuing relationships, and that is simply that there is a value placed on people that we can't miss. Try to catch this idea. We'll take the Bible, the text, <clears throat> and we take this text and it's so objective without realizing what it is that it was born out of and how it was used. It's born out of relationships. In so many of Paul's letters, he's writing back to the people that he was with in order to continue to mentor and disciple them. We see it all through the scriptures. I was looking through Genesis and realizing how funny Genesis is. 50 chapters. Big book. 50 chapters. Out of 50 chapters, one chapter on creation of everything. One chapter. One chapter on sin entering the world that screwed up everything. One chapter. 36 chapters on four people. Think about that. It's like God's like, okay, I created things. Yeah, that was amazing. Oh, you guys screwed it up. 
50 chapters, 36 of them are on four people, the lives of four people. Look at that balance. What does that tell us about God and his value that he has placed on people? In three books alone of Paul's, in three books alone, he has 34 people mentioned. There's some name dropping. But he doesn't know what name dropping really is because you're supposed to name drop of people that we all know. Supposed to be famous people. He is mostly naming people that we had never heard of and that we'll never hear of again. Everyone knows how to say Epaphroditus only because of this text. And not many of us name our kids Epaphroditus. And let me just thank you for that unless there's an Epaphroditus in the room. Sorry about that. There's a tremendous value on people. He says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. You know where he is. How many missionaries write to the church longing to send people to visit us. I've actually never heard of that. It's the other way. We are the ones writing to the missionary serving in the hut on the deserted island, wondering why they're there, and we're going to send someone to We're going to send a team to go encourage you to build another hut. Paul is the opposite. He's like, I'm just... I'm so longing for you, and so's Timothy, and Paphroditus loves you so much. My heart is going to do good if we can get them to go see you because of the value of the relationships. Yeah, I, I see that. I see that in verse 3 of the same chapter. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of us not look to our own interests, but the interests of others. Paul is in under house arrest. He has his private Roman soldier guard. It's a house-ish, so it's comfortable. He's got his his coffee maker, and he's got his key things, but he's under house arrest. And yet he's looking to the interests of others. He's not looking to his own interests. So we get into a mindset where, even here, we come here in hopes to get a little shot in the arm for the week and get encouraged and challenged and enjoy the fellowship. And so then we live our week and we struggle with things that... Maybe something breaks. Uh, maybe, you know, you got to fix it and you got to figure out who to call and there's stuff going on at work. There's something very common to that scenario besides the fact that we're just struggling with getting through our own week. We're, we're not seeing the Christian life, living a good Christian life. We're not seen as a means to an end, which is helping others. We see it as an end in itself. We're consumed with ourselves. I need the Lord because I'm struggling through this. And it's all us. It's all me. And success is that I can come here, get encouraged, and I can walk closer to the Lord, and I can have more joy in my life, and my life goes better. That is not Paul. That is not the message that Jesus... Jesus' message is, no, no, no. You have a humility about you, and you look to the needs of others. We're not here just for ourselves. We're here for ourselves so that we could be healthy walking with Christ and communion with Him so that we can be involved in the lives of other people. And even Paul had it when he was probably at his greatest place of need. So I think we have a lot of concerns on our mind. <clears throat> I will point out on, on, on a side note, 
saw this in Isaiah. Let it speak for itself, Isaiah 58. If you spend yourselves on behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday. That's interesting. That principle that when we get the eyes off of ourselves onto those who are in need, it actually makes us better. We actually, it brings healing to ourselves. Do you guys recognize that for yourselves? I mean, it's the hardest time to do it. I mean, when you're really in need, one of the best things to do is, all right, I'm going to go find somebody who is in need, and I'm going to go help them. I'm going to get the eyes off of myself, and I'm going to help others. Now, the examples are endless. How did Jesus, on the, cro- on the cross, a device that's built for the sake of suffering, I mean, that was the point of the cross. It was a genius device to make you suffer to an nth degree and for a long time. How did he in that state be able to communicate with the guy on the cross and show compassion? How could he have looked down and actually, hey, take care of mom? How did he also say, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing? He was so focused on the needs of others at a time in which if he'd been complaining, there'd been not a person in the world that would have said, you know, he was a little bit of a whiner. He's up there dying just thinking about himself. Nobody would have said a word. But even in his greatest point of need, his eyes and his mind was on other people. So if you have kids or you're part of a family, the the makeup of each member is so unique. Um, With three kids, one will be with us next week. Uh, But Grant is the oldest. Grant's like the, it was like raising grandpa. He has this moral compass about him that even when he was little, I'll make a joke of some sort and he'll he'll go, "Uh, dad. Don't say something like that. Emma's in the room. And I'm like, oh, sorry, Grandpa. And so he had this strange maturity about him all along. And I remember um, he's a pretty quiet kid, and he had already been diagnosed with his eye disease. It was fifth grade. So he'd already had that going for two or three years. <clears throat> was still in the process of, like, walking into doors. That was hilarious back when we didn't know there was a problem. He would just walk down the hall right into a door. After school one day, fifth grade, I picked him up, and I noticed all the kids holding these little clay candy dishes, all in his grade. And I'm like, oh, that's kind of cool. So he's got his backpack. He comes, gets in the car. And I said, so where's your ashtray? I called it an ashtray. I said, where's your, uh, where's your little ashtray, your candy dish? And he goes, uh, I said, didn't you make one? He goes, uh, no, I gave, it to, I gave it to Steve. Oh, OK. So we're driving, and finally I'm like, you didn't like your uh, candy dish? Like, you just unloaded it? Did you sell it? <clears throat> and he said, uh, <clears throat> quiet. He goes, oh, no, um, I loved that little candy dish, Dad. He broke his, and he was crying in class. And he's just sitting there. And I'm like, so you gave him yours? Well, yeah, he stopped his crying. I said, was the crying bothering you? <laughs> you know, I'm still looking for the other reason. Like, what were you doing? It's this idea that he modeled for us over those years of decline, worse being junior high, worse is junior high anyway, but junior high and officially going blind and watching him always looking out for people around him. I don't know if you're, are you given to it? I think so. I think some have a personality that is better for that. So they have an advantage. I think some do. 
Was he taught that? I, I don't know, maybe by Sarah. Didn't get it from me. I called it an ashtray. I, I don't know. I do think he was the closest to the Lord out of the three growing up. I think that's pretty clear. Is that where he got it? I'm not sure, but I know that in a season in which a lot was going on in his little mind, he was always looking out for the people around him. So pause for a minute. Just assess our normal week. You do have a lot going on, and I, I don't want to diminish any of that, as I wouldn't with Grant. Went through something, still does, that I, I don't know how to relate to that. So it's legitimate what you're going through, and it could be health, could be relationally, could be a financial disaster, breakup of family. There's so much, and it's legitimate. You really have a heavy weight. Well, so did Paul. Paul was anticipating execution. He got out of it in this case. He was eventually freed a couple years, recaptured, and then ex executed. So it came. He knew it was going to. So the imminent danger that you're struggling with today, and it's very difficult, that imminent danger how can we raise the level of care and value on people around you? I think it was early on that there was a, a, a way in which I tried to think. Certain people you help, there's advantage, which is fine. So certain people you help, and then they end up helping you, or you're helping them, and the family's so grateful, they love it, and so you have some type of benefit, and that's good, that's okay. I like to gauge who in my life am I looking out for that I have absolutely no expected benefit outside of spiritually helping them and God blesses me, outside of that. I think those food boxes down in that place that I can't pronounce, Appalachian Mountains, right? I, there's an advantage. I mean, I, we don't get anything out of that. When you volunteer at a local nonprofit, you go, you spend your time, you leave, there's no parade, there's no rising up and calling you blessed. It's just. That's a really good sign. I still want to help people that maybe they end up, ends up helping me somehow. I think that's great. But Paul's looking out for people, he has no benefit. It's just so in him that it has no discrimination. Help the rich, help the poor. It's all the same to him. There was a great care that he had. He valued people, but there was also just a great care that he had for people. It's really found in this section on Epaphroditus. I thought it necessary to send to you, Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need. For he's been longing for you all and has been distressed because he heard, uh, because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill. In fact, it was bad. He was near death, but God had mercy on him, but also on me because there'd be sorrow upon sorrow if something happened. I'm, the, I'm all the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men, for he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. 
This is another like Genesis thing. That's a lot of verses on this guy. I mean, that's a, that's a section. I mean, if you literally, if we were to count the words between that and that famous hymn of Christ, that amazing part that said that he who considered something, equality with God, something to be grasped and emptied himself and he became a servant to death, even death on the... You take all of those words and count, and there's a lot over here on Epaphroditus. He had such a sensitive care not just for him, but knowing what it's going to do in the hearts of those people that he's, that he's writing to. I think the strength of this church is this. I've heard it at churches, oh, it's a friendly church, and I hear that, and it's true. It seems, though, abundant life's kind of a couple steps above that. Have you noticed that? Like, Casey, you've mentioned that too. If you don't know, Casey's our new office manager, by the way. Lift your hand up there, Casey. There she is. All your needs are met right there. Um, Her email address is forgetaboutit at albc.com. So, no, I don't, I'm not going to give it to you. But you've, you and Chuck have mentioned the same thing. There's just an overwhelming spirit of kindness here, of caring about people. VBS is how far away? Three, four months? Sue, you're a big part of that. And I'm told that, uh, like, the leaders are pretty much, you've got most of the leaders in place. You do. Isn't that Okay, no, that's good. Need some volunteers. That's the caring aspect. Planning this far ahead. There's only one one plan. It's to care for the kids. I mean, that's that's the plan, and we have it downstairs in the nursery right now. We've got the greatest people working in the nursery. The greatest people committed to working with the kids in VBS. value people, care for people. But here's this next step, and I, this is one that maybe is that, maybe this is the challenge. He multiplied himself. So he valued relationships. We see that all through the Scriptures. Tremendous value on people. There's a great care for people. But Paul was multiplying himself. So this was the deal. When Paul was out of the scene finally, when Paul was finally gone, there were Paulettes everywhere. Timothy was one. He'd replaced himself. When you and I bring people to Christ, that's addition. When we train and develop people, to do, that's multiplication. Who are you multiplying? It's from everything from volunteer stuff. It's great that you're volunteering at a nonprofit, but to look for other people to invite to join you in hopes that some of them may catch on to this, that's multiplication. Paul multiplied himself. Jesus multiplied. He was so much that he said, it's better if I go away. He's got a dozen of them to go out, not just a dozen to go out, but a dozen to go out to get others to go out, to get others to go out and to multiply. We have a belief in Jesus Christ. We were created to be in a perfect relationship with God. That's what was the intent. And then sin came into our lives and separated us from God. And the only possibility of renewing the relationship with Jesus or with God was through faith in Jesus Christ. He did all the work, died as a sacrifice, so that belief in Him were in a relationship with God. And if the plan was just that, just that you're in a good, healthy relationship with God, he should have just taken us home right away. 
But that wasn't the plan. The plan is that we are in a healthy relationship with God and we struggle and we grow and we learn things and we make mistakes and we're trying and trying. It's so that we can reach other people for Christ, that we can reach other people, that we can multiply ourselves into the lives of others. Who is walking close with God today because of your influence? Here, here's a... Here's a a very challenging statistic, who have you literally led to Christ? How many have you, because of your influence, they know Jesus, they're now walking with Jesus, and I'll tell you, there is not much greater joy. I like leading somebody to Christ, but I'll tell you, when you lead them to Christ, and now they're growing, and they lead somebody to Christ... That's over the top. That's multiplication. Well, we're in a struggle in America today with morality, and we're in struggle with people coming to know Christ, and we're in struggle with churches are, are floundering, some are growing, but it's, it's seasonal. And the problem today is our inactivity. We can point to everything we want to that we don't like in America, and the fingers all the way go back to, yeah, but as a church, who have you guys led to Christ? Well, I'm just living as a good example. Okay, and they don't care. Who have we, let, who have we multiplied ourselves in? All of a sudden now, it's you're walking with the Lord and you're managing your sin, which is what it ends up, sin management. And we're walking with Him and keeping our sins under control and we're trying to grow and we go to church and we're, we're doing all that. That's good. That's great. For what? We're called to go into a world and reach people for Him. So here's a classic model for you to think about, just as a, to work towards. A classic model of discipleship is that we should have, and it, it peaks, but in process, three types of people in your life that are very important. And it's a Paul, a Timothy, and a Barnabas. That you have a Paul in your life you having somebody in your life that is more mature, more solid in their faith than you are. Think of who that is. Somebody that's, that you look up to, somebody beyond you that you can actually spend time talking to and learning from, that's your Paul. But then you also have a Barnabas, the Barnabas is like you. This is where we're strongest. The people you can phone call with, they struggle at different times as you, but they're basically the same place in life. They've known the Lord basically the same amount of time. They're very similar. We're at the same level. That's the Barnabas. Paul, the Barnabas, and we all need a Timothy. Timothy. The Timothy is the one who is newer in their faith. And you say, oh, I don't know, I'm pretty new and immature. Oh, no, no, there's, there's plenty of Timothys out there. It's somebody who's in class with you that you, you're pretty sure they know the Lord, but they're not walking, they don't go to a church anywhere and they don't do anything. That's your Timothy. You don't tell them, you don't have them wear a name tag. So you don't say, hello there, I have a plan for us, like young Sheldon would do. We have a plan for you. You could be my Timothy. And they'd go, you're a creep. You're really creepy. No, it's somebody that you're just looking out for and that you're because you're further along. You know what's coming for them, and you know what they need to do to grow in their faith, and so you're just spending some time with them to see that they're up and running. It's a Paul, it's a Barnabas, and it's also a Timothy. Have you guys met anyone famous? 
Who's, who's like the most famous person that you've met? That, you, that you're like, yeah, that was a big deal. Let me hear if someone's famous. Yeah. The carpenters. I met a plumber. That was kind of cool. It's Joe Sistek. Where is Joe? So, where were you? Really? Look at that. Met Clinton. Is that a win? Uh, Cara. Cara. <laughs> I don't know. Heather Locklear is pretty good. Mark, do you have one? Oh, you were looking at the mic. Yeah. Jimmy Doolittle. Jimmy Doolittle. Who's that? Didn't Doolittle have a farm like a van? Okay. Okay, where were you? Yeah. Ooh, okay, that's pretty cool. Oh, Stallone. That's kind of cool. I don't know, it's not Clinton. Tom Selleck. Really? I mean, these are big ones. Who else? What? Oh, yeah, it was very influential. Okay. Anyone else famous? Anyone? Yeah. Who? Oh, yes, hockey. Gotcha. Okay. Okay, well, that's pretty good. Any other athletes or anyone else big? Who did you see? Who? Oh, Agassi. Oh, yeah, no, I got it now. That's right. Okay, yeah, there you go. And mean Joe Green's pretty cool. And tall, oh, huge, huge. Yeah, there's a reason he has the name. Name dropping, I, I haven't. I don't know that I've met anyone that, that amazing along the way, but um, uh, Danny Trejo, that was kind of cool. Do you guys even know who that is? Okay. The name dropping, this is what I want us to think about. I want us to think about the name dropping like Paul did of people that you're looking out for and caring for to somehow see ourselves not merely as, I'm here to grow in my faith. Yeah, I know, and if that were the case, do it online. Because you could, well, Gene and I were talking about that, weren't we? Watching it online, you can do that, but it's different being here, isn't it? There's a different, you do it online, you also get a better preacher. That's a plus. The downside is, that's not the reason we gather. We gather to interact, to show the influence on one another, and that's what I want to encourage, encourage us to do. Value one another more and invest ourselves more into the lives of those people around us. Won't we stand together? When we stand, I'm going to close us in prayer.